Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 3 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is machine learning rules. Often while analyzing the data, our objectives are either prediction or clustering the observations into uniform groups or classification or feature selection or dimensionality reduction or detection of anomalies, etcetera. Machine learning plays very crucial role in fulfilling these objectives. The main purpose of this lecture is to discuss the basic concepts of machine learning. We will consider the V fold cross validation simple cross validation also, bootstrapping, etc. Machine learning actually evolved out of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a broader area and in artificial intelligence our main focus is to create an intelligent system. That is uh, the machine is able to think rationally like human to solve problems. We have discussed this topic uh, in the last lecture. Now, the intelligence actually requires the ability to learn. So, the objective of machine learning is creating computer systems and algorithms so that machines can learn from previous experience. Of course, learning from experience is a part of artificial intelligence. So, you may consider machine learning as a subset of artificial intelligence. So, machine learning algorithms learn patterns and relationships from data without being explicitly programmed for every task. Say for instance, uh, you have fitted a particular model for the data and uh, then you are continuously getting data from some source. Now, it may happen that uh, with the new set of data, your model may change or your model may require some modifications. So, your algorithm should be like this that uh, without reprogramming the entire problem, it should be able to modify the model means you do not have to program it for every task. It should be able to modify itself. Uh, now, machine learning is uh, central to various types of problems involving classification. For example, handwritten digit recognition. So, you have a set of observations, say you have written a particular letter say A in different manner A a and somebody may write it in a different way. Now, your the algorithm or your program should be able to identify all these letters A. Now, suppose uh, your machine identifies all these letters as A and you have one more sample this one, this is also A. So, it should be able to modify itself or it should be able to learn this A also. So, it plays a crucial role in handwritten digit recognition or speech recognition. It has been trained for a set of sample on a speech and suppose it gets 
some new observations, then it should be able to modify itself. Face recognition or text classification. Then classification is based upon knowledge obtained from a learning or training sample of similar examples, where the class of every example is known and the measurements on the future example. So, basically you have a learning or training sample of similar examples and class of each example is known. Then you train your classification rule and then you have measurements on the future example. Then your classification rule should be able to accommodate those future examples also or it should be able to modify itself according to the future examples. Say earlier initially you have these three examples and your model has been trained according to these three letters and then you have one more observation or one more example. Then your model should be able to or your classification rule should be able to modify itself according to this example. Then machine learning methods require a combined effort of statistics, computational learning theory and AI to analyze large data sets. So, it basically machine learning methods rely upon these disciplines statistics, computational learning theory and artificial intelligence. Then different statistical learning techniques which are used to solve the machine learning problems are regression, pattern recognition such as neural networks, discriminant analysis, tree based classifiers, random forests, bagging and boosting support vector machines, clustering and dimensionality reduction methods and density estimation. We will consider all these methods in subsequent lectures. Then we may divide the machine learning methods into supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, your learning algorithm receives a set of continuous or categorical input variables. Your input variables may be continuous or categorical. And then you have a correct output variable also. So, input variable is given or input variables are given and the output variable is also given. And basically your objective is to find a function of the input variables to approximate the known output variable. Since supervised learning not only the input variables, but output variable is also given and accordingly you have to train your model. So, we study the relationships between the input and output variables. If the output variable is continuous, then it is a regression problem. Again, we will discuss it in detail in a subsequent lecture. And if the output variable is a categorical variable, then it is a classification problem. Now, in unsupervised learning, there is no information available to define an appropriate output variable. So, inputs are given, but uh, there is no information about the output variable. Say, suppose you have a set of observations and you have to classify those observations into different classes and you have no information about the number of classes or you have no information about which observation belongs to which class. So, for classes you do not have information, output is, is unknown. If the classes are also known and then you train the model or you train your classification rule, then it is a supervised learning. If the classes are unknown for each observation, then it is a an unsupervised learning. Then your objective is to explore particular characteristics of the input variables, such as estimating the joint probability density. 
So, suppose you are interested in estimating the joint probability density function of the input variables. You have no information about the probability density. So, it is unsupervised learning or searching possible clusters. You do not have any information about the clusters or the which observation belongs to which cluster. Still, you have to train your model. You have to develop a clustering rule. So, it is unsupervised learning. Drawing proximity maps, that is maps showing the distance from selected features by gradient shades of color, say. Again, this is an unsupervised learning or locating outliers, you do not have in any information about the outliers, whether the particular observation is an outlier or not, you do not have any in information, you do not have any information about the output variable or imputing missing data, you have some missing data, so naturally output is unknown and you have to impute that missing observation. Unsupervised learning is also referred as scientific discovery. Now, we come to batch learning and online learning. Uh, first, we consider batch learning techniques. Batch learning techniques generate the best predictor by learning on the entire training set at once. You consider the entire training set and then you fit your model or your apply your learning technique and then uh, you generate the best predictor. Online learning techniques, data becomes available in a sequential order. So, in batch learning you get the entire data uh, at once, but here in online learning data becomes available in a sequential order, just like time series data and it is used to update the best predictor for future data at each step. So, suppose you have data available up to this point of time, you generate a predictor, then you get more observations and then you update your predictor. So, each time you get observations, you update your predictor. Online learning is used when it is necessary for the algorithm to dynamically adopt to new patterns in the data or when the data itself is generated as a function of time, just like uh, time series data. So, you do not get observations, all the observations at a time and you do not want to wait for the future observations for prediction purpose or for training your model. So, you train your model on the basis of available data and uh, then you make prediction or you generate the best predictor and uh, as soon as the future observations arrive, you update your predictor. The, some examples are prediction of sale of a product say this is a, a time series observation or you are getting observations sequentially or a stock price prediction. Again you are getting the observations sequentially. Up to present you have observations, so you train your model and then you get more observations with the passage of time and then you update your model. Prediction of tourists visiting say a particular city like Jaipur, again you have observations up to a point of time. So, you fit the model on the basis of data available up to present and as soon as you get more observations sequentially, you keep on updating your model or you keep on improving your predictor. Reinforcement learning. 
in reinforcement learning. We are rewarding desired behaviors to encourage the agent to use them and punishing undesired behaviors to discourage them. And in reinforcement learning, we seek long term and maximum overall rewards to achieve an optimal solution. Say, for example, automated robots. Automated robots actually learn using reinforcement learning. Suppose robot's movement is right, correct, then for future prediction, it rewards the desired behavior so that it encourages the robot to use it. And suppose a particular movement of the robot is wrong, then it punishes that undesired behavior or it discourages that undesired behavior. So, this is how the robot learns with the passage of time or with the experience by rewarding the desired behavior or and by punishing the undesired behavior. Then we define error. Error is actually the difference between true output value and corresponding predicted output. For instance, in regression problems, suppose y is a particular output value or a particular value of the output variable and the predicted value of y is say y cap, then how much error is there? y minus y cap. Then we define prediction error. Estimate of prediction error is the re-substitution error. We will define this re-substitution error later on. In regression problem, mean of the squared errors of prediction is your prediction error. Say, suppose you have different observations and their predicted values, then we take a square of these errors and suppose you have n observations. So, you take summation 1 by n, n is the total number of observations, you take summation over i. So, y i is the actual value of output variable, y i cap is the predicted value of ith value of output variable. You take this error, take a square of this and then take average of these squares. Then the substitution estimate. Say residual mean square is uh, defined as a fitted model is used to predict output values. You have fitted the model and you have this, you get this predicted value of out variable. Then the substitution estimate is the mean of the squared residuals, this quantity. In classification problems, probability of misclassification. So, suppose the classifier predicts the class of each case in the entire data set. And uh, if the class is predicted correctly, then there is no prediction error. So, you give it a score 0. And if the class is predicted incorrectly or the observation has been misclassified, then you give it a score 1. Then the substitution estimate is the proportion of misclassified cases. So, suppose uh, you have n observations and out of these n observations r is r observations are misclassified. Then this is the proportion of misclassified cases. Now, actually this re-substitution estimate uses the same data as was used to derive the predictor. For this instance, in regression problem, suppose 
you have fitted this model and then you have predicted the value of y corresponding to x equal to x i say y i. So, y i cap is the predicted value of y and y i is the actual value of y. Then in obtaining the resubstitution estimate, you are using this data, same data which you have used to estimate the values of A and B. So, you are using the same values for deriving these predictors and then you are using the same values or same set of observations for obtaining the substitution estimate. Generalization for improving the resubstitution estimator. Now, one of the option is we randomly divide data into three non overlapping independent sets. Basically, the substitution estimate depends upon the same set of observations which you have used for obtaining the predicted <coughs> values. But how your rule or how your model is going to behave for future observations, you do not know. It may have very low resubstitution estimate, but for predicting the future observations, it may not behave properly. So, that is why we randomly divide the data into three non overlapping independent sets. Uh, first set is learning or training set. So, learning set is the data set on which we perform preliminary testing looking for patterns trying different models. So, for this set of observations which is called training set, we fit different options or different possible models. Then the second set is validation set. We use data set for model selection. Say suppose on the basis of learning set, you have fitted different options say model 1, model 2, model 3. Then ultimately you require the single model. So, on the basis of validation set, you select either model 1 or model 2 or model 3 on the basis of their performance or their predictive ability. Suppose you have selected model 2, then again on the basis of test set, we assess the performance of a completely specified final model. So, this M 2 is the completely specified final model and then to observe its performance, we use the test set. Now, notice that uh, the three subsets of data are generated by the same underlying distribution. Usually, we divide the data into learning validation and test set like this. Uh, we take first 50 percent observations in the learning set and then uh, we remaining we divide the remaining 50 percent observations into 25 percent, 25 percent uh, validation and test sets. So, each of these sets validation set and test set contain 20, approximately 25 percent observations. Although this is not a very hard and fast rule, so it also depends upon how many observations you have or your the particular problem. Now, in some cases, we merge the validation set and the test set, thus forming a larger test set. So, this is also possible. Uh, we combine these two sets and then you get a larger test set. So, for example, publicly available data sets in the internet databases often divided into a learning set and a test set. So, again it is your choice whether the you want to divide the observations into learning set, validation set and test set 
all just in two sets learning and test. Uh, it depends upon your problem or your objectives. Now, in regression problems, the prediction error is the mean computed over the appropriate data set of the squared errors of prediction, where error is the true output value minus predicted output value. Uh, for the learning set, regression learning error is the prediction error computed over the learning set L and regression test error is the prediction error computed over the test set T. In classification problems, we built a classifier from L, the learning set. Then we use this classifier to predict the class of each data vector in either L or T. You can use this classification rule or the classifier for predicting the class of both the learning set as well as the test set. Again, we assign value 0 to a correct classification and 1 to a misclassification. Then your prediction error is average of the 0 and 1 over the data set or proportion of misclassified observations. Say you have some zeros, some ones and total number of observations is 6. So, you divide it by 6. So, this gives you the proportion of misclassified observations. So, this is your prediction error. Again classification learning error is prediction error over the learning set L and classification test error is the prediction error over T. Now, if L is moderately sized, suppose you do not have uh, uh, much observations. So, when you divide the observations into learning set and test set, then L is moderately sized. Then using only a portion of the entire data set to fit the model is a waste of good data. So, basically what you are doing? You are fitting the model for our learning set and since you do not have much observations or sufficient number of observations. So, it may le not lead to a good model. So, basically it is a waste of good data. That is why you require some alternative data splitting methods and then using those alternative data splitting methods, you can estimate the test error. And uh, these alternative methods are cross validation and bootstrap. Now, we consider v fold cross validation. In v fold cross validation, what we do? We randomly divide the entire data set into say v non overlapping groups of roughly equal size. So, suppose you have 100. 1000 observations. Then you may divide these observations into 10 different groups. So, you remove a particular group, say first you start from here, say you remove it. So, now you have 900 observations on the basis of these 9 groups. Then use the omitted group as test set. So, you fit the model or you form the classification rule on the basis of these 900 observations. So, if this is a classification problem, then we use these 900 observations and for developing the classification rule. And uh, the last group is used as a test set. 
Then we predict output values and compute the prediction error for the omitted group. Then we repeat the procedure v times, each time removing a different group. So, first time you have removed the last group, next time you may include this group, you may omit this group, you use this group as your new test set and then you repeat this procedure and you repeat this procedure v times. In this particular example, you repeat this procedure 10 times, each time removing a different group. Average resulting v prediction errors to estimate the test error. So, whether it is regression problem or classification problem, ultimately you get v prediction errors and you average those prediction errors to estimate the test error. So, this method is called the v fold cross validation. Bootstrap. In bootstrapping, we draw a bootstrap sample and by a bootstrap sample means we take a random sample with replacement. Say again you have 10,000 observations and from here we draw a random sample of the same size, but the random sample is with replacement. So, some of the observations may be repeated in the random sample. So, we draw a bootstrap sample from the entire data set having the same size as the parent data set. Fit a model using the bootstrap sample and compute its prediction error. So, we consider the bootstrap sample which is a random sample with replacement and then we compute its prediction error. Repeat the sampling procedure each time computing a prediction error and then average all the prediction errors to estimate the test error. Uh, but uh, one thing you must notice that uh, since this is a random sample with replacement, so some of the observations are repeated here. So, each time you are getting a different sample, although the sample size is still say 10,000, but some of the observations may be repeated and some of the observations may not be included in your bootstrap sample. Then cross validation and bootstrap are computationally intensive techniques. Cross validation uses the entire data set in a more efficient manner than the division into a learning set and a test set. Because uh, in v fold cross validation, you are using v minus 1 sets for training your model and v th set for testing your model. So, in fact, uh, all the observations are used somewhere either as uh, the observation of the learning set or as the observation of the test set in cross validation. Expected prediction error over the test set is also called infinite test error or generalization error and it is estimated by test error and basic objective of this generalization theory is to choose the regression model or classifier that gives the smallest generalization error. So, out of all possible regression models or classifiers, we choose that one which has the smallest generalization error. Now, we consider the problem of overfitting. The problem of overfitting occurs when the model is too large or too complicated or it contains too many parameters relative to the size of the learning set. For the example, suppose this is your output variable y and then you have different input variables. So, and uh, it is a regression problem and you want to fit a simple multiple linear regression model. So, you have 
the interceptor plus now you have a large number of input variables so you are tempted to use all those variables so you keep on adding these input variables say this r may be very large actually you, you want to predict y as accurately as possible so you keep on adding these input variables and you think that each time you add a variable it improves the performance of your model the temptation to find a model that will fit the data in l as accurately as, as possible leads to a very complicated model and the model has a large number of parameters also say alpha beta 1 beta 2 so on beta r and the number of parameters keep on in increasing as we add more variables so it may make the selected model too complicated and uh, if you consider the learning set since you have fitted this model for the uh, data in learning set so it results in a very small learning error actually your fitted model is optimized for the data set belonging to the learning set but the resulting model may have a large generalization error as a consequence of overfitting you are overfitting the model you are in including a large number of input variables which may not have any effect on y the output variable so although your learning error is too small if you consider the generalization error then the generalization error is large so it appears that the model is quite good on the basis of the learning set but on the basis of test set its performance is not good so in fact uh, the prediction involves you know, the out of sample observations so for prediction purpose the model is not good now here comes ocom's laser principle if there are two competing ideas to explain the same phenomena the simpler one should be preferred or this rule or this principle is also called the principle of parsimony or law of parsimony so just uh, complicating your model increasing the number of parameters may not work well on the basis of learning set it may appear that the model is improving its performance is improving but uh, when you consider the test set also then uh, for prediction purpose it may lead to large error this ocom's laser encourages to choose simple models and it controls the temptation to choose complicated models without losing track of the need for accuracy of course your model has to be accurate but it should not be too complicated simple models are preferred if the learning set is too small to derive a useful estimate say suppose you have uh, just uh, 10 observations to fit a multiple regression and uh, if you ha have fitted the multiple regression involving nine input variables or 10 input variables or 12 input variables or even for six input variables then your estimates may not be 
very efficient or quite useful. And in fact, in the multiple regression problem, if you have less observations than the number of parameters, then uh, you may not even be able to obtain the estimators of parameters. So, that is why simple models are preferred if the learning set is too small. Actually, to derive a useful estimate or fitting a more complex model requires huge amounts of computational resources also. Methods for reducing the effects of overfitting include say regularization, say complex models are penalized in favor of simpler models. So, we penalize the model which is more complex or we penalize the model which has more number of parameters in favor of simpler models. Then methods using some form of averaging of predictions made by a number of different models fit to the learning set say bagging or boosting. So, in bagging or boosting what we do in instead of fitting a single complex model, we attempt to fit a number of different simple models and then we try to uh, obtain some kind of averaging of predictions. So, instead of using a single simple model, we have used a number of simple models, number of different models and then we fit those models to learning set and then we obtain some sort of averaging of predictions. Now, we consider sampling design for obtaining data. We consider this problem say your objective is to develop model for whether the business get bankrupt or not and its initial debt. So, you want to classify a particular business whether the business will get bankrupt or not. And then you are also interested in estimating the initial debt. Now, you have two possible ways of drawing the sample. The first one is prospective sampling scheme. In prospective sampling scheme, what we do is we randomly draw a sample of size say n from the population of interest and then take observations on its depth and whether it has gone bankrupt or not. So, your population has two kind of business. some of them may get bankrupt, we denote those business by cross and some may not and you have to draw sample. So, what we do? We draw a random sample from here of size 5. Now, your random sample may have two business which get bankrupt or it may have no business which may get bankrupt, this one or this one or you may have whole business which may get bankrupt and then we follow each business through time until it gets bankrupt or not. So, ultimately you may have this kind of sample or this kind of sample or this kind of sample. This kind of sampling is called prospective sampling scheme. In biomedical research, such kind of studies are also called cohort study. You have the entire population and from that population, we draw a sample and then we follow that sample. So, you have prospective sampling scheme. 
Then the second kind of sampling scheme is retrospective sampling scheme. In retrospective sampling scheme, we consider population of business that did not go bankrupt and then sample 50 percent observations from them randomly. And then we consider population of business that go bankrupt and sample 50 percent observations from them randomly. So, we wait until the business gets bankrupt or not and then we divide the population into two parts, those who get bankrupt and those who do not get bankrupt. And then say we sample 50 percent observations from randomly from those who get bankrupt and 50 percent from those who do not get bankrupt. This kind of sampling scheme is called retrospective sampling scheme. In biomedical research, this is called case control study. So, artificial intelligence is a broader field creating intelligent systems and uh, we may consider machine learning as a part of artificial intelligence, which uh, mainly focuses on uh, algorithms and uh, data analysis techniques. And in this lecture, we have discussed different basic concepts of uh, machine learning like supervised, uh, unsupervised and reinforcement learning, uh, bagging and boosting. Then we have also discussed uh, cross-validation, v-fold cross-validation, etcetera. In since uh, in data mining, we consider multivariate data and for analyzing multivariate data, we also require uh, matrix algebra, different tools of matrix algebra or different results of matrix algebra as well as uh, basic knowledge of multivariate analysis. So, in next uh, two lectures, I will discuss the matrix algebra results which are required for, for the lectures and uh, then we will also discuss uh, uh, the basics of multivariate analysis, particularly I will focus on multivariate normal distribution. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you. Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I am interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of 5 a day. That is you should have 5 portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately you could say 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now a portion, before we go further, I will just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice which is approximately 150 milliliters. 
and uh, maybe three teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a five a day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five a day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for 2 plus 5 policy in which it said that you should consume five por 2 portions of fruits and 5 portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespect of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So, the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators and if they exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which con conducts information regularly on demographic and socio-economic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so, uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So, approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits and uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equal into one portion. So, data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK data health survey. So, the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So, it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits and as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So, if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables and then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So, what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now, ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance body imbalance that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables and we did find insignificant results. Apart from that infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS etc. we found similar insignificant results indicating that our, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that we went uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So, it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health whereas 
as far as vegetables are concerned they impact a women's health more but this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol now after this we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication we found we tried to find two policy implication what matters and exactly how much portion matters so as far as how much portion matters we have found that on an average five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health that is your self assessed health your map your incidence of high map and incidence of high bp but if you want to have a good mental health so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well and similarly has uh, as far as self assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits apart from that vegetables have had a very little impact on your health it only impacts your incidence of getting high map and high bp and uh, you it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits so an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended but fruits have a more impact on your overall health on various measures like self assessed health mental health your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters it has been seen that all size fruits they impact your self assessed health your systolic and diastolic blood pressure your mean arterial pressure your high bp and incidence of getting high map and high cholesterol but we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned they have a they help in regulating your incidence of getting high map or high bp but it has a trade off that means there is something negative happening it reduces the good cholesterol in your body apart from this it if you ha if you ha have an incidence of getting high cholesterol it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol and uh, dried fruits they impact your self assessed health as far as vegetables are concerned very little impact has been seen it has only been seen in case of a uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self assessed health another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite they have an association with good cholesterol so overall my research basically says that there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators and um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume five or more portions of fruits and five or more portions of vegetables per day but fruits have a more impact on your overall health apart from that all size fruits they have a better impact on your overall health your mental health various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol so thank you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams, but I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral vulgar and senseless george bernard shaw absolutely loathed shakespeare as he did homer but perhaps no other criticism about shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller provided someone has told him the story earlier now this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true none of shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever 
they are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.